Okay, well, let's take our Bibles to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. And uh, this is kind of funny, um, it's kind of a funny thing because last week I really did uh, what I call like an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. And it wasn't an introduction where we got into, you know, what's going to be in each chapter and how it breaks down. Uh, we'll kind of do that part as we go. It was more an introduction on who is the sermon to, what is it for, and that kind of thing. Well, tonight we're going to be kind of starting the first portion of the sermon, and it does, well, we break it down into sections to help us to understand it, and the first section of the sermon is the Beatitudes. And so um, tonight is actually going to be an introduction to the Beatitudes, okay? So it's, I, I don't know that I've ever before had two introductions in a row, um, but here we are, because there's just... There's so much here, and I kind of, sometimes I have to weigh, okay, do I have one hour 20 sermon, or do I have a couple of like 30 minute ones, and I know what the vote will be, so just keep your hands down, and, uh, and that's where I try to, to just, you know, land in a, in a comfortable place for everyone, but also I just know that if you, if you charge ahead too quick, and you don't really lay the background work, and you don't, and, and, and you don't give that full context, it's just less meaningful. And so I uh, just want to spend the appropriate time. And so I want to introduce to you these first 12 verses of the book of Matthew. And uh, we'll read those in just a moment. But first, I just want to review a little bit uh, from last week and just tried to answer a couple of simple questions last week. The first one being, well, what is the Sermon on the Mount? What was the, the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount? And uh, really, I kind of established this, which I, I threw a... Tr- I didn't know it was a trick question at the time. I understand now it was a trick question. And uh, so I want to try to articulate a little bit better um, what I was trying to get at there about what is the Sermon on the Mount? What is the purpose is this? The Sermon on the Mount is not the gospel by which we are saved. OK, because that would be works salvation. If we in other words, if there was a stand, which there is a standard of righteousness, we're holding it right here. So if someone could live perfectly to the standard of the word, well, then, then no, they would not be a sinner, right? And, and we understand that none of us can do that. Jesus is the only one uh, who has done that. So I said something to the effect of, well, you can't teach a lost person to act like Christ. Well, I was thinking one way and you were thinking another way. There are people that absolutely that have morality that are not Christian, right? And I think, I think that's what you guys were saying because you all answered yes and it surprised me. And I thought, what did I just say wrong there? Because I just said something wrong. I was trying to lead you the right way. Um, but anyway, what, what I, there, there's a teaching out there that says something to this effect. If we could just teach this world the Sermon on the Mount, boy, that'd just change everything. Well, um, that's not untrue. You just need to say a little bit more. And, and let me say it like this. You will need, you will absolutely need the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit to live the life that is preached in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, you will need that. And even as we talk about these Beatitudes, um, what we're going to see is that God, Christ has given us this standard, and He's taking the law and He's elevating it to His level. So He's teaching us what the Christ-like life and the, the life of a true disciple looks like, and it's something to shoot for, but I'm going to tell you, it is a high, high bar. And so he takes the, the even in, we'll, we'll, as we, you'll see this as we go through, he'll, he takes the, uh, what we would say, the sort of the physical elements of the law, and he raises them to a, a new level. So let me just give you an example. Um, he, he gives the example of adultery in chapter number five and verse 27. You, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, to which all the Pharisees, well, we would never commit adultery. Well, they would. I mean, it's. That's all in the Gospels, but we would never do that. But notice what Jesus says. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, let me just tell you, that is a much higher standard. Okay, so now what Jesus is teaching is, I, I, I want my disciples to not even look in lust much less the actual act of adultery. And so he, he raises the bar to his level. And so the point I was trying to make is what, what we need to be preaching out there to the masses is that they need to be saved. They need, they need the gospel of Christ. They need to be regenerated. 
What would really change our town, what would change our country, is if people just started getting saved. Because once they get saved, yes, they will then have the indwelling Holy Spirit and they'll have the Christ's power to live that, uh, that Christian life. Um, but they're just, uh, you just hear quite a bit about, well, boy, the Sermon on the Mount is the best sermon ever preached. I agree. It's Jesus' words. I absolutely agree. But I, and, and, I, I, and I, I believe, I, I wouldn't be preaching it if I didn't think it was something that we ought to strive for. Um, but I, I just believe that uh, we're going to need Christ's help. We're going to need the help of the Holy Spirit because it is a standard of perfection. I mean, what, what the Lord Jesus lived was perfection. He, everything He did, He did right, and He did righteously. So then what is the Sermon on the Mount? Well, it's teaching us how to be Christ-like, teaching us how to be true disciples of His. And so in that question, I tried to ask this question, who was the sermon for? Well, if we look at verse 1, it says, "...in seeing the multitudes..." So he, his eyes are on the multitudes, and, and by the way, his heart is for those multitudes. He, he, it, it, just, it gives the Lord a stomach ache at times to look at these multitudes that are without him and need him. And so his, his heart is like, we've got to reach these multitudes. He says, "...he went up into a mountain, and when he was said, his disciples came unto him." And so he is going to teach the disciples how to live the Christ-like life so that they can go out from there and be a testimony and a witness to the multitudes. So I said this, he, he teaches this to the disciples for the multitudes. The disciples are, are his already, they're believers. So he, he's, he's teaching that. And by the way, that's the same plan that we see all throughout the Bible as we come to church um, not, we come to church to hear from God's Word so that we can uh, shore up our lives, so we can live better for Christ, so that when we go out, out of this place, you ever see one of those signs on the back of the church that says, I love it, I, I don't know if we should put one up or not, but it says, church is over, now the service begins as you're walking out. That's a really good thought because we think, oh, church services are here. You know, it's really true. Once we leave this place, we're still the church. And now we've got to serve him in our uh, wherever, what, whatever realm of influence that Christ has given us. And so uh, it, it would be, and, and by the way, it's not that our lifestyle replaces our message. It's that our lifestyle, uh, it, it goes along with our message, right? Our lifestyle doesn't need to contradict our message. And so it doesn't give us the excuse to not, with our mouth, say the gospel or preach the gospel with our mouth. But you understand if we're living like the world, and preaching the gospel, we're not going to really have an impact because people will, uh, well, they'll, they'll laugh at us just like they did at Lot when he got himself caught up in that very same thing. And so the Lord's trying to teach his disciples, uh, not trying to, he is teaching them how to be and uh, wanting them to be peculiar, to live God's way, to be holy, to, to be set apart so that they would have an impact on the multitudes going forward. And then he, he does, he sends them out and and he empowers them later on in, in, in all those things. And so the, the preaching here is that we would just know and we would, in, in, we would increase we would, uh, in our uh, walk with the Lord, that we would get closer to the Lord, and that we would be better disciples of His every day. And uh, it's interesting as I've been uh, really studying and praying through this one, and I'm, I'm praying through what we're going to be doing on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, I'm just telling you, and it's not me that did it because I'm not smart enough to do that. It just seems like God's weaving all of these things together to, to tell us if we're going to have an impact out there, then God's got to have an impact in here. I mean, that's really it. If, if we're going to go out and we're really going to make a difference in our communities, then we've got to allow God to impact our personal lives. Our families don't get better unless our family members get better. Right. Uh, and, and so so I, I if I want my family to, to be better, I have to be better. Um, our, our church is made up of families. So how do you think that continues to flow? Right. How, how will our church become more and more impactful this year? Well, it's when our, our our the individuals in our church draw closer to the Lord in this year and they grow and they become more. more and, I'm, and again, I'm not saying we're not disciples. I'm saying we're becoming better disciples of his learning to follow him. And so that's really um, the, the, the sense you get when you read this sermon, all these things that Jesus is teaching and, 
And we're going to go through them all very, um, pretty slowly, I think, and, and look at them. But I, I just want you to know this is for, for you. If you're saved today, this message is for you. If you're not saved, you need to be saved, and then this message will be for you. But this message is for you because we are called to be disciples. And, and remember, um, I think I said this, not every Christian, sorry, let me start over. See, this is the kind of stuff I just need to write down. Um, every disciple is a Christian. Okay, you can't be a disciple of Christ if you're not one of His. So every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple. Not every Christian has decided to, uh, to follow Christ. Yeah, they, they may have been saved and, and they may be forgiven, but um, if you read Matthew 13, there's some of those seeds that fell by the stony places, and they grew, but by and by, because of tribulation, right? And then and there's, they didn't put down any root, and so they, they go away. Or the, the one that's choked by the weeds, is, there, there's Christians who have been, gotten caught up in this world, and, and, and they've been made unfruitful. Well, we don't want that to be us, right? We, we want to be disciple, real true followers, disciples of Christ, not just in name and not just in label, but in how we live our life. So I suggest to you that the, the theme of um, the sermon, the theme of these three chapters is Matthew 5 and verse 20. So let's take a look at that. I said, it says, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there's a couple of thoughts there. And when I get to that verse, I'll, I'll try to explain to the, as be, best I can. Understand, again, what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying you've got to live to this standard to get to heaven. It's not what he's saying. Uh, but we do need a, a righteousness that's better than the Pharisees. Right? Christ's righteousness is better than the Pharisees, let me tell you. And, and so we, we need a, a righteousness that exceeds what, what, what those living in that day would say. These are the very best people. Jesus says, well, you need righteousness better than that if you're going to see heaven. I mean, that's just it. And so we need Christ's righteousness. And again, that's imputed to us when we are saved. However, he is teaching that um, there's a certain way to walk as a disciple and follow the righteousness of Christ. And so this Sermon on the Mount is the elevation of living to Christ's level. Now, let's look at Matthew 5. We're going to read the first 12 verses together. And, and really, the, what I'd like to do tonight is just introduce the uh, Beatitudes to you. Okay, look at verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... So here are the Beatitudes. There's eight of them here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So I just want to explain to you, these are how, how Christ, he starts out and he sets out to, to teach his disciples and he starts with these uh, beatitudes. And, and what you're going to see over the next few weeks is that these, uh, these things, these eight things that he's telling his disciples are um, incredibly important in, um, in, in the Christian life. They're in incredibly important in our uh, growth between us and the Lord. Um, there's, some, there's some inward things mentioned here. Um, there, there's some things between us and the Lord, which we could maybe call upward things. And then there's some outward things like being pure in heart and, and being merciful and being a peacemaker. So in these Beatitudes, he's dealing with our heart before him and our relationship to him. And he's dealing with our relationship uh, to others. So I just want to start by defining what is a 
beatitude. Because the Bible doesn't say the word beatitude here. Where do we get that? And so I just want to explain why we call these the beatitudes. Now, we, for a long time, I thought of these, and, and this isn't a, necessarily a bad way to think about the Beatitudes, um, but I've, I've, when I studied the Word and I just really went deep on, on the words blessed are, which is where we get the word Beatitude, um, I learned I was kind of looking at it the wrong way. So the word Beatitude sounds like what word? Not, no trick questions tonight, I promise. Hey, there you go, to be of a certain attitude. That's perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. And for a long time, that's kind of how I thought about it. Okay, here are some attitudes to be, right? Be attitudes. It would, it would make sense. Um, in other words, poor in spirit is an attitude. I need to be that. Um, there, by the way, let me say, there's nothing wrong with, um, with thinking that way because certainly that's true. We are, he's telling us, be poor in spirit right? Be a peacemaker. He, he wants that. But when you study the word, what I learned is that's not what, that's not where we get that word beatitude. It's not what the word beatitude means. Um, and so we can do a little bit better than that. So let me give you a few definitions. The Webster's definition of the word beatitude, which by the way, we get from, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. It means this, a state of utmost bliss. That's what the word beatitude means. A state of utmost bliss um, Webster would even define, this is why I love Webster, in his, defini in his definition, or any statement made in the King James Bible that start with, blessed are. Isn't it funny why we say blessed sometimes and we say blessed at other times? I don't have any real relevance to that other than I just caught my, I catch myself saying it both ways. I don't know which way I should say it. A state of utmost bliss, a state of being blessed. Okay, so a beatitude is a blessed position. It's being in a blissful situation. Now just, just think for a second. Um, a mourner, verse 4, a mourner being in a state of utmost bliss. Now you see the problem? Okay. Uh, those who are poor in spirit, but yet being in this state of joyful happiness. Uh, another definition, I think this one's out of Zondervan, but he, his definition is the joy of heaven or a declaration of blessedness, especially by Christ. So this, this word comes from the Latin beatus, which we get our word beatitude from. Uh, so the word beatitude is speaking of the blessing, not necessarily the attitude. The attitude's there, but, but the, the purpose or, or the, the, the thrust of these verses is if you want to live a blessed life, here are some attitudes, here are some things that you, are, you, you could conform to that you need to do, and, and these things, will, will, you will truly experience blessing. Now, we'll work on that in just a second. I, I came up with an, a, a definition um, just after reading several definitions, and I said this, the Beatitudes are states of blessing, pure happiness that can be gained by certain character traits or spiritual qualities or, or even situations of poverty and suffering we face as Christian. So of these eight blessed uh, uh, positions of blessing, five or sorry, seven of them result from spiritual qualities. One of them results from suffering. So whenever they're taught, the emphasis is on blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Um, it's not necessarily on the character trait, although we will deal with that because that's how we receive the blessing. But what the Lord is trying to implore us to understand is that there is a way to live a blessed life, and it's much different than the way the world would tell you to live a blessed life. And so we need to understand and make that or just help help our brains to comprehend what we've been ingrained in our in our whole lives thinking this is how this is how we measure blessing in our life this is how we measure blessing in our life we may have that not necessarily wrong but we we may not have that understanding deepened enough the the blessed life as a christian doesn't have the same 
substance as the, quote, blessed life of those who are lost. Okay, someone who's lost are, is not going to think when he is in a, um, verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger. Aren't, don't you feel enormously happy when you're hungry? Is, doesn't that just bring you joy? You think, man, I'm, I'm blessed because I'm hungry. You see, it takes the spirit to understand something like that. And, and it'll take hopefully some preaching when we get to that verse. So 44 times, this word is used um, in the Strong's. You can find that this word is uh, makarios, which I'm sure I butchered. Uh, it comes from the word makar, which means supremely blessed, fortunate, blessed, happy. The word is translated 44 times as the word blessed, five times as happy, another time as happier. So let's explore the word just a little bit. I'm going to give you these, just jot these verses down. One of them is in John 13, 17, where Jesus says, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. That's the, the Lord says, here's some things to know. And if you know them, you'll be happy. You know what he was talking about in the context there? He's talking about serving with humility. He's like, if you'll serve with humility, if you'll learn that, by the way, it has to have something to do with being poor in spirit. Uh, if you're serving with humility, you'll find ha you'll 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 experience true happiness. Um, in Acts 26, verse two, another verse you could write down. Paul says, I think myself happy. Same word. King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all things wherever I am accused of the Jews. Here is Paul, and, and he's being persecuted for righteousness sake. Verse 10, it's one of the Beatitudes. He's being persecuted, he's being put on trial, and he declares he was particularly happy at that moment because he could give his defense. And I believe because he knew he was about to give the gospel to all those people that are listening. But, but again, a, here's a Christian in a what we would say a bad situation, but they're experiencing happiness. And, and, and here's Paul saying, I think myself happy, Agrippa. It must have sounded so strange because everyone in there knows he's a prisoner. But he's happy. In Romans 14, in verse 22, the Bible says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. Romans 14 is a scripture about restraining oneself for the benefit of other people. And, and happiness comes from self-restraint so that we're not a stumbling block to other people. Is the world, is the lost world marked by their self-restraint? No. And, and what would we say? W would restraining ourselves typically bring joy or something other than that? Right? And so we, we've got to understand there's a, there's a different level of living here that Christ is getting at. So a couple more examples that you could look at where happiness comes from adverse situations. And one of them is in 1 Peter 3, verse 14. And, and he says this, but if you suffer for righteousness sake. So just pause for a second. That means if you're doing everything right and you suffer. Happy are you. You say, how can you even say that? I'm just reading it. OK, living that is I'm just telling you, we're going to need the spirit's help. We're going to need the Spirit's help if we're going to be happy when we're suffering for righteousness sake. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 14, if you be reproached for the name of Christ. Everyone enjoys a good reproaching. You see, you see what I'm getting at? Okay, uh, happy are ye. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 40. This is an interesting one. And again, I think this, I don't, this is why I don't like just reading a bunch of verses because there's such a context here. This is about a widow who uh, has, she's been widowed and, and um, th there's a question, well, should she go get married again? Should she not? Neither is wrong. But here's what Paul says. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the spirit of God. And he's talking about, I think she'd just be happier alone. Now, who thinks loneliness is you could be happier lonely? Again, we have to get into context there to go further. But I'm just telling you, when that word is used in the scripture, it's, it's never put beside, well, 
Happy are ye if you receive a lot of money. It's never put in that, you know, go read the Bible. It never says that. Um, in fact, we need to really redefine and discuss our view of what it means to be blessed. Um, I'm going to say a few things here, and none of these things are wrong. I just, I just want us to deepen our understanding of, of that. We can, we can be blessed and live blessed and, and, and be happy and experience Christ's joy even when the world in our same circumstance wouldn't. That's the point. Um, what we call a blessing. Things that make us happy, we tend to say that's a blessing. Um, areas where God has answered prayer or given us some help or, or whatever. And that's not wrong. They are blessings. And those are described as blessings in the Scripture. Um, some other examples. We call our children blessings most of the time. Right? Not at bedtime. But at other times, I remember holding those kids in my arms when they were still small enough I could hold them in my arms and just, just the incredible surge of joy that God had given me this little bag of bones to try to raise. And it also was accompanied by a healthy dose of fear, but I was very much feeling blessed. Nothing wrong with that. Um, when we're experiencing good health, isn't that a blessing? I mean, how, how often do we, especially when you're going through that prayer list, do you just say to yourself, wow, I am blessed in health? You know? And nothing wrong. That's a good thing, by the way. I'm not, this isn't a setup, okay? It's, it's a blessing to be in good health. It, it, financial stability. Oh, it's a blessing, isn't it? Isn't it a blessing when... Um, you sit down at the end of the month and you made more money than you spent. Yeah, that's a huge blessing. It means you're going the right way. Even if you just break even, it's better than going the other way. Sure, it's a blessing. Friends, loved ones, those are all blessings. But here's something peculiar. And what you, when you study these eight Beatitudes, what you're going to find is none of those things are really mentioned in this list. And again, it's not that they're wrong. I, I think we, can, we all know what a, good, what, a, what a blessing is. But to elevate our thinking, our living to where Christ is, He's explaining to us we can live with that same feeling of contentment and happiness even when we're financially stable even when we're not in the best of health, even when our prayer hasn't been answered yet, because there are other things in our life, deeper things in our life that drive happiness or blessedness. Um, and we've been talking about a little bit on Sunday afternoons about joy and how Christ gives us an inward happiness that is not affected by the circumstances of life. I'm just telling you, no lost person, well, at least none that I know, is going to look at this list and say, that's what I want for my life. That sounds like a happy, blessed life. Poor in spirit. Boy, I would love to be poor in spirit. Mourners. I'd love to go about my life mourning. Meekness. Oh, yeah, I'd love to be characterized by meekness. You know what meekness is? I can't, I'll, I'll, we'll get to it. Meekness is, um, they say, power under control. So meekness is like, I like to simplify as best I can. Meekness is like letting your six-year-old daughter beat you at arm wrestling. You could win, but you won't. You know, to this day, I've never won a game of tic-tac-toe with my kids. Meekness. Humility is another thing we'll talk about. I'm just, I hope you're picking up the, the humor, folks, okay? <laughs> but no, that's meekness. That's not how our world's, we're not characterized by it. No, if we have power, we show it. If we have power, we, we're, and someone's against us, we're going to pummel them. But that's not the way that Christ teaches us how to be. He said something about, like, turn the other cheek. Well, I could beat that guy. Doesn't matter. 
meekness. See, our world doesn't operate this way. And turning the other cheek around every corner just to them doesn't seem like that would bring much happiness. But you know what it does? It draws us closer to the king that we're trying to serve. It, it, in fellowship with Him, it, it brings us to a closer, uh, a more intimate relationship with Him that we are able to enter into. And, and that is where we're going to find that, that joy, that happiness, that blessedness, that beatitude. So, as we go through the list here, poor in spirit, the mourner, the meek, the hungry, and the thirsty, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the merciful, the pure-hearted, the peacemakers and the persecuted, what we're going to find is that there's sort of a twofold blessing. Okay, there's blessings to come. And you, you see this like in chapter or, or chapter 5, look at verse number 12 there. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Okay, so some of the blessings are like for later. But a lot of these are, are this. And, and I, w- I want you to understand this. We don't have to wait to get to heaven to be blessed to experience the blessings that come with being a disciple of christ we don't have to wait Um, many of these talk about what what's going to happen in our lives currently if we're living a certain way we'll find our happiness in in knowing the lord better if he's telling us this is what he wants us to be that's because he is these things and it's like when, when Paul said that he wanted to know him and he wanted to know him more, he mentioned the fellowship of his sufferings. He's saying, if I have to suffer to know what it's like to be more like Christ, then so be it, because I want to know him. And as we know him more, we receive blessing, happiness. Again, just, just contrast, and, and this is what we're going to do the whole time we're in this sermon, is it's a huge contrast to how the world thinks and how we ought to think. I'm just telling you, there's too much of worldly thinking in our brain. Okay, and, and I, we equate, if, if we were to sit down and just take a test and, and they ask us, what is a true blessing to you? Many of us would have the same answers that they would have. And that's not good. We ought to be experiencing blessing that they can't experience because we know the Lord. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5 says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. So much of, and and again, I I know being financially stable is a blessing. I I hope I already said that. But it's more than that. That's, that's, the, that's a worldly way to think. He says, from such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I can read biography after biography of missionaries, of, of, of other ministry people, pastors, things like that, even, even uh, non-ministry people who are just living for Christ that suffered greatly, but would describe to you they were living the blessed life. I'm just telling you, there's more to being blessed than what we know. And that's what we're going to get into in these 12 verses. These eight Beatitudes. So I'll stop there tonight. Next week, I promise we're going to get in. No, I'm sorry. Two weeks from now, I promise. Next week, I will be at the Church Planners Conference in Oklahoma City on Wednesday. So I'm going to miss church next Wednesday. I promise you I'll be in church, but it won't be here. And uh, But two weeks from now... Uh, We will start with the poor in spirit, verse number three, and I I think it's going to be good. I'm excited to go through it with you. So let's pray together, and we'll be dismissed tonight. Lord, uh, help us as we go through these Beatitudes. Lord, help us to understand that, and we don't discount the blessings you give us and the the things we've mentioned tonight. Lord, there's, there's so many ways in which you bless us, it's just unbelievable. But Lord, we, we desire to know you more, we desire to be your disciples, and your word tells us if we'll live out these traits that you've, you've put forward in this sermon, that there's a certain blessing that comes along with it. And I pray as we look at these over the next few weeks, you'd help us to understand them, help us to, to mold and make our lives 
um, after your example. And Lord, that we might receive that blessedness here and uh, in the world to come. I pray you dismiss us tonight with your love. Be with us as we go throughout the week. Keep everybody safe and, uh, and warm this weekend. And Father, we just pray you'd bring us back Sunday for a great time uh, together. We'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.